Welcome back to the Foundry's YouTube channel. We're so happy that you decided to connect with us to see what God is doing in and through our church. If you want to stay connected throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into the series I'm so excited about called Believe. So we're talking today about Sardis. And uh, this church, what I want to do before we dive into it is I want to ask you a question. Has anybody here ever um, seen a stone facade, right? Actually, this building we're in has a brick facade on it. It's not a brick building. It's actually a block building. It's a, it's a concrete block building that has holes. They filled them with concrete. And then onto the outside of it, they slapped up, not just, you know, just slapped up, but they put up, the masons came and put bricks in on top of the block. The structure of this building is concrete block. The facade of it is brick. And when we talk about facades, we know this. It looks good on the outside, but actually it holds no structural integrity. It does nothing real or solid for the structure of the building. It's a facade. This is a block building with a brick facade. And we understand that. And I want you to hold on with me to the ideas of a facade tonight. Uh, today, when you, when you get the idea of a facade, something that dresses up the outside. We're going to dive in. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, to the church in Sardis, to the angel of the church of Sardis, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds, and you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Like, that is a big word. This is a big word from Jesus, just wake up. I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have been taught and what you've heard and received. Hold fast to it and repent, but if you don't wake up, I will come to you like a thief in the night, and you will not know the day or the time in which I will come. Yet there are a few of you in Sardis who have not soiled your robes. And they will walk with me, Jesus says, in robes of white, because they are worthy. And to the victor, to the one who is victorious, they too will wear a robe of white. And will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their name from the book of life. Rather, I will declare their name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When we talk about the church in Sardis, what we have to understand is that Jesus is speaking to the Apostle John, and he's speaking a word to this church, and he's calling them out for the idea of being a church that has a facade. They look really good. So we're going to look Look at some of those facades and we're going to name them. First thing is this, Sardis had an inclusive facade. They played well with others. And it's important that we note that they had this, this inclusive facade that allowed them to, well, unlike the other churches we've talked about in Thyatira and Pergamum and Ephesus and the different churches in Smyrna, what we have to look at and understand is in Sardis, this church wasn't out under any external pressure. They weren't being kicked out of society. They weren't being removed from their homes or their businesses. They were in a city that allowed them to worship as they felt they wanted to. Actually, Sardis um, had this the second largest or the largest synagogue outside of Israel in their city. They had another temple to the to the goddess Sibylle, and we'll talk about that later. But they played well together. They they weren't pushing on each other or really fighting over anything. So we, we know that the Jews and the Christians and the pagans all lived on the same block, and they actually, um, they knew each other. They, they behaved well to get together. They were very inclusive. And Christianity in Sardis kind of accl acclimated or acclimatized to the spiritual temperature around them. They lost the distinction of who they were. 
that in this inclusive environment, Christianity kind of acclimated to the culture around it, and it lost its distinction. They began to miss the element of sharing their faith. In this week's devotions, um, you should have read uh, Luke chapter 10, and these devotions are available right at the exits and the entrances when you come out. Please take one when you go. But when you read um, this week, you would have read Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 20, and it was Jesus talking to the 72 who followed him closely and saying, go out, and he sends them out. But here's the thing. He told them to go and share the truth. Go and share the truth. Not go and be inclusive. Go and share the truth. Go, go give them the good news of Jesus Christ. It was each person, each city, each region's responsibility to respond to the gospel because what mattered in the end was having their name in the Lamb's book of life. And Jesus said, go, share the truth. Talk to them. Share your faith with them. Jesus drove his disciples out. Jesus' last words to the church was, go therefore into all the world, right? Go tell the truth of the gospel. Go speak it to anyone who will listen. It is their responsibility and their city's choice to respond to it or not. You be faithful in the commission to go and share the truth. Speak the gospel out. They lived in an inclusivity facade. The next facade we see is the uh, purity facade, the facade of the Temple of Sibylle. Now, this would have been the largest structure in the city of uh, Sardis. The Temple of Sibylle had some unique things to it. It was a mother goddess kind of temple worship. And here's one of the interesting things. You could not enter into the Temple of Sibylle unless you were wearing pure white robes. Now, you may think like, Eric, it's like 80, you know, like 90. Nobody has bleach. Nobody gets white robes. And I will tell you this. We were in Africa this summer in Zambia, and I have never been like, we were out in the bush for like a week. I've never been so dirty in all my life. I'm a habitually clean person. And some of you are like, really? That's hurtful. But um, but still, it, I, I, I am very clean. I do not... I just don't like bockiness, you know. I don't like, well, oh, it's gross. I like to be clean. That's just me. And um, we were out there. I was a special version of dirty. I, you know Pigpen on the Peanuts who walks around, there's just a cloud of dust around him all the time? That was me. It was horrifying. And we went to church. I just, oh, I felt like you could just finger paint on my forehead. That's a little vivid. And um, here's the thing. We get there, and there were people from the villages in the whitest shirts. I was like, how'd that happen? I saw the homes they came from. There's no way. I was like, how'd that happen? And the reason I say this is there is ways that people could launder and make sure their clothes were sparkling, gleaming white. We saw it for ourselves that that could happen. So I look at this, I go, okay, these people going into the temple of Sibylle would have to be wearing sparkling, gleaming white robes. And they couldn't go in. If they were dirty, if they were stained, they couldn't go in. The sparkling, kind of gleaming white robe was the extent of their purity. Nothing beyond their robe was pure because once inside the temple, you got into some brutal practices, some things that kind of turn the stomach when you think about it because what happened is in the worship of Sibylle, they would participate in these kind of terrible, brutal things, these practices that would go on, and they would begin to kind of ramp up in their intensity. They would result in self-mutilation and eventually castration, okay? So your robes are all bloody and they're dirty and they're stained. Once they get inside, their robes aren't kept white. But to get in, you had to do that. Here's something interesting about this, and it's just a cultural reality because we talk about Sardis, and it's way back there 2,000 years ago. If you go to worldreligion.com and you type in Sibylle, the goddess Sibylle, you will find that Sibylle is worshipped widely today in our day and age, in our nation, probably in our area. There are areas that worship Sibylle, and they are pagan, Wiccan feminists and the transgender groups. It is literally a pagan god worshipped in modernity right now. So it's not so far distant 
And there's this purity aspect to it that is a facade. And it's false and it's a lie. It looks good until you get into it. The next thing is the security facade. Now, this one is especially fascinating to me because Sardis uh, thought they were secure. The church in Sardis, remember, they're not being persecuted. They're not being squeezed by Diocletian and the different emperors. They're not being harmed and put to death for their faith. They're living and having interfaith barbecues with their other friends. Things are really good for them. And there's a security facade. They thought they were secure. They thought they were accepted and they were busy. Remember what it said. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. They are the church with a really full parking lot, tons of program programming, moving along, buzzing like a beehive, and it's dead on the inside. They didn't bother the people around them. They didn't bother them. They just kept to themselves. They thought it would keep them safe. And Jesus is saying, no, no, I will destroy you. I will come against you. Your safety isn't the issue. Your faithful witness is. Jesus warned that if they did not respond, so he said, remember what you have received and what you heard. Hold fast to it and repent. Repent of your ways. Jesus says this, because I will come at you like a thief in the night. Now, this is warning a warning that would be so specific to their culture that it would kind of set off alarms. So catch this. Like, you know how if um, we know our history, if I talk about the Battle of Gettysburg and you don't know what's happening, I want to know the name of your history professor. That is wrong, right? I mean, it's a civil war. You have a context for it. If you, you should know about the Battle of the Bulge. You should know about the, you know, George Washington and the crossing of the Delaware. You should know these things. Historically, we have a history. We have a history in this country, and most of us know the broad swaths of it. If someone said to us, you know, like 9-11, we all go, oh, yeah. If we were alive, we remember that day. We remember that day like my grandparents remember Pearl Harbor Day. We remember it. We have a history. This phrase, I will come at you like a thief, has a history that causes a reaction in the ears and the hearts of the people of Sardis, and here's why. Before Sardis was a city, it was a city-state. It was ruled by King Croesus, and King Croesus built an impenetrable wall around the city of Sardis. And King Cyrus, I want to go into this so bad and I have to be disciplined, but King Cyrus, the king king of the Persians, he kind of came up out of nowhere, but I can't talk about it, Um, but he's this huge, he's the king of the Persian Empire, okay? He comes against the city of Sardis as he's marching west towards Greece, and he goes up and he surrounds and besieges it. Now, when you besiege a city in the ancient world, you build um, siege ramps to go up and try to invade it, and they were just getting massacred outside of Sardis. The walls were too strong. King Croesus had built a fortress and you couldn't get in. They were holed up inside. They had food, they had water, and they could wait the enemy out. They're the ones out in the desert. And so we find this story kind of like, oh, what, what's going to happen? One night, King Cyrus has some spies working their way around the city, watching what's going on. And one of them looks up, and, and it's weird because I've been in the Middle East, and there's these nights where it's just... You, it's like daytime, the moon reflecting off the sand, and a guy looks up and he sees, one of the spies looks up, and he sees in a watchtower a guard, and the guard has the distinct posture of someone who's fallen asleep, right? Head kind of at a wrong angle. And then you hear the weird tank, tonk, tonk, tank. It was his helmet. It fell off and fell outside the wall. And the guy's like, oh, oh no, I dropped my helmet. I'm going to be in so much trouble. So the, the spy's watching him. And the guy disappears. And then suddenly at the base of a wall, a secret entrance opens. And the spy goes, we didn't know that was there. And the guy gets his helmet, no harm, no foul, runs in, secures the entrance, goes back up, puts his helmet on, and keeps his watch. They report this to King Cyrus. King Cyrus goes around the city, starts a fight the next night on the other side of the city, gets all the troops moving there, and what does he do? He knows where the secret entrance is. They came in like thieves, and before their army knew it, the king, the, the army of King Cyrus was in their city behind them, and they were destroyed. They would have been like, oh, 
Don't come like a thief in the night. That's our security facade. That's the thing that says, we'll be safe. We have really good walls. We're protected. They would have thought, oh, don't come like a thief. That's devastating for us. Here's what Jesus is saying. Your facades don't matter. What actually matters, what only matters, is that you're actually alive, that, you, that you're alive. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. That's what Jesus said to the church of Sardis. Your reputation is a lie. What actually matters is that you're alive. And Jesus says to the church, wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. Jesus is calling them to something. And um, if you had done devotions this week, which I encourage you to do, on day two, you read from the book of Ephesians, chapter five, verses one to 20, when the apostle Paul talks to the people in the church of Ephesus, and he begins to talk to them about what it means to truly be alive. And I want to read through this scripture. I want it to kind of settle in our hearts and hear this as an admonishment to us of what Christian life may call us to do and may call us to be. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because they are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. For this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, greedy person, such a person is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They're an idolater. They will not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, don't be partners with them. Don't go have the interfaith picnic because your community is like, well, we'll tolerate each other. We'll coexist. That is a lie. We will evangelize and share our faith constantly. Paul is saying, wake up. Don't be lulled to sleep under the pretext, pretext of um, this sense of like community, and and you know nobody's fighting if nobody's shouting, right? And this idea that we can have some sort of a compromised peace. And what Paul's saying is, don't get acclimated to the evil. Don't get acclimated to the evil. Wake up. Wake up. The situation is more dire than you realize. I always say it when people hear that half of Zealand does not affiliate with any particular religion, people are like, that just can't be. There's no way. Not our town. Not this area. There's way too many churches. Wake up. We have become like the proverbial frog who jumped into a pot of cool water thinking everything's fine, not realizing that we're getting acclimatized to something that will kill us. And it's slowly cooking us alive, this culture is. And finally, we end up, not only are we, um, are we losing our, our distinctness and the things that make us a witness for God, we're losing our very life in the process. Wake up, strengthen What is not yet dead? When God speaks to the church, he's not not mincing words. He's calling to them. Don't get lulled to sleep by the perception of peace. Paul goes on to say, you were once in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Live as children of the light. Find out what pleases the Lord, having nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, which takes me back to the temple of Sibylle. It looks good going in, but it comes out a bloody and profaned mess. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live. When I say, be careful how you live, when the Apostle Paul says, be careful how you live, he's not saying, you better be careful, you can lose your salvation. No, he's saying, be careful how you live, because your life, though you're saved, your life is called to be a living witness, and if you're not careful how you live, you don't give witness to the one who saved your soul, and you have to give an account for the life you live. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity 
because the days are evil. Therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There should be coming out of our daily living. So here's the thing. Have you ever gone by one of those great big churches, even here in, in our town, and you can hear the music? Anybody? Like in the summer when the, like, the windows are open and somebody's like, Rini, and they're playing the organ, which is, that's how it sounds in my mind. But they like really hate wailing on it. Or you go to one of the great cathedrals in Europe and you hear the songs coming, you're like, wow. It sounds like the temple, the building is making noise. I want to tell you something. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your life should sound, look, and seem like a church with its windows open and music coming out of it. You should be a living witness to who Jesus Christ is. The distinctiveness of who you are is defined by the work of the Holy Spirit in you, maturing you in your faith so that your life literally begins to become like a song of praise. And people look and go, I don't know what it is about them. I don't know what it is about them, but I'm just drawn to them. It's like their life is a song. It's like there's something that's just joyful around them. When we look at that and understand that what happens is we're called to live like a church with its windows open, with the music pouring out and people going, what is that? I want some of that. Because we don't believe in a facade of inclusion, we believe in solid inclusion, real inclusion. Just like some in Sardis, we are easily deceived that we're being inclusive, doing the right thing, and acting like, well, all faiths are equal. They are not equal. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life, and nobody gets to the Father except by me. So here's the thing. If all faiths are equal, you're in the wrong building. We do not adhere to it. I don't think Muhammad was right, Buddha. I don't think any of them are right. I'm not saying they're bad people at all. I'm saying they are not following the truth, and we own it. We need to speak the truth in love. Why? Because we know it. We know the truth. It's anything but inclusive to be like, no, all faiths are equal. I don't know, no. You know, you kind of have that, that heartstring pull, like you want to say that. So let me paint it in a different picture. You're the rich uncle or aunt. You're the rich aunt or uncle. And you've decided to take your five nieces and nephews to Disney World. All expenses paid. paid. You're staying at the greatest hotels down there. You got tickets, park hopper, the whole thing, Right? And you say to them, we're meeting up at this time, at this place, all you have to do is go to the travel agent, and they will give you your tickets. And then you meet me at the van, and it's 22 hours straight south. We're going to stop at a hotel, we're going to have fun, we're going to hit all the Cracker Barrels and Chick-fil-A's we can find, it's going to be great, right? We're going to have a great time, we're going to eat at the Varsity in downtown Atlanta, it's going to be awesome. And the kids show up the next day. Three of them have their Disney passes on little lanyards tucked in. They're like, yay. And you're like, oh, cool. Two of them have homemade lanyards with homemade tickets inside. And they're like, oh, we didn't go pick up the tickets, which were bought and paid for. We didn't go pick them up. We made our own. And you're like, okay. I don't want to ruin it for them. So everybody gets in the car, and you begin playing like the license plate game, and you're driving along, and you're having fun. One kid's like, I ate too much, and they feel sick. So you pull over, they gag on the side of the road, they get back in, songs erupt, they're playing, they're having fun, they're watching movies. It's just, everybody's like, oh, can you imagine how much fun it's going to be? I want to ride Space Mountain, I want to ride Expedition Everest, I want to go on the Tower of Terror, this is going to be great. I can't wait for our Winnie the Pooh breakfast, followed by our Cinderella dinner. Amazing! This is going to be great! And you get down to the park, everybody's excited, and at the gates, there's three kids, exuberant and joyful, dancing around. And there's two kids looking at their uncle going, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me that this wouldn't get me in? Well, I felt bad. I didn't want to ruin the drive. What? Ruin the drive? I'm stuck in Florida looking at what I want and seeing everybody else go in and I'm excluded. 
Why didn't you tell me? Well, I, I knew you would enjoy like going to Cracker Barrel and talking about all the rides, but I want to be on it. Well, sorry, I just didn't want to make everybody uncomfortable when we left. Huh. So tell me, do you think Jesus Christ is going to be like, you know what, I understand that you were too uncomfortable to share your faith with someone and that all faiths are equal because, you know, we didn't want to offend. No, he's not. He didn't die on the cross for us to water down the gospel. And he calls us to live a fully, solid, inclusive faith. Because what that that rich uncle did with the Disney trip is what you and I do when we water down the faith. And we're like, so I had this today. I've not had the greatest week, and I'm in the middle of, uh, yeah, I was getting my hair cut, and somebody told me, she's like, is it your weekend off? I'm like, no, actually, I preach tonight. I'm a pastor at a church. And she's like, oh, really cool. I'm a Buddhist. I'm like, awesome. Well, not really, but awesome. You know, I'm being polite. And, um, And she said, my kids are Christians, but I am not. But here's the thing. I really think that, you know, in the end, All religion is just trying to make us better. I didn't want to have this conversation. I had bubkiss for interest, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Can you shave my head and let me go free? I don't want it. And and you may think like, wow, what a neat pastor. I didn't care. I was tired. I just, I had to get here to preach a sermon on it, not live it, right? And I'm sitting here, I'm like, ah, are you kidding And so I'm sitting there, and I just, um, I didn't have it in me as a person at that time. I was like, and so I just kind of quietly prayed, and I just said, do you know the reason why I love Jesus so much? Her whole expression changed, and she just looked at me. I said, here's the thing. I think we are supposed to be better people. I totally agree with you on that, but here's the thing. I know that if I go to heaven to get in one day, and it's on my good works and how good of a person I am, I'm never going to get in, but I also know this, but if I trust in Jesus, I, I, I get in Even if I'm not that good of a person, because of him, I get in. That's why I follow Jesus, and that's why I love him. Scissors in hand, she goes, oh. And I was like, I know, right? And like, God told me, because I don't really care right now. I want my sucker, and I want to go home. I didn't evangelize much more. I was like, where it's Foundry Church? I was wearing this shirt. I was like, where it's Foundry Church in Zealand? Actually, some ladies from this place go to the church, so come on out. Love to see you. You don't have to feel it. You have to obey. We can't milk down the faith and pretend that inclusion is silence in the face of a lie. We can't pretend that it's okay to tell people, no, you're doing good, all faiths are equal, and they're on their way to hell. We're on our way to glory with Jesus Christ, and we have the chance to lead them to the truth, but because we didn't want a discomfort, we'll put them in eternal torment. It seems selfish and wrong. The Apostle Paul, again, in devotions in Romans 11, 11 to 14, he talks about us being grafted into the line of, of people, the, the, is the Jewish people, of being grafted in like a branch put into a tree. And he talks about this and he says, look, you were brought in. The Gentiles, you and I were brought into this faith. And maybe our inclusion in it will make the Jewish people jealous because they're the apple of God's eye. He loves them. They're the people he chose. And maybe by our inclusion, they'll become jealous and all the more joy when they come and join the faith. Paul's saying you've been included. You've been grafted into the line of faith. We are children of Abraham, the great patriarch of the Old Testament. We are grafted into it. And we look at that and we understand that inclusion matters. And we look at what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's trying to save the Gentiles, but deep down he betrays his hope. The full inclusion of the Jewish people will be the joy of God's heart. Why? Because he knows that God loves them. He knows what they mean to him. And ignoring it and pretending all's well because they're close enough isn't going to go well with God. God's not going to be okay with this. And when we look at it and understand, we can kind of wrestle with the fact that maybe we're asleep, like the church in Sardis. Remember what I said? In Sardis, there was the largest synagogue, a Jewish place of worship. There's the largest synagogue outside of Israel. It was the size of a football field. They were next door to the apple of of God's eye, the people he loves so much. How sad and heartbroken is God 
when these people don't get included, when they don't get brought in and he put the church next to them. Solid inclusion is the ability and the willing, willingness to step up and have a hard conversation and share your faith. It's important to think of what the church in Sardis was missing. They were missing the opportunity to teach the the people who followed Sibylle what true purity was. It's important to recognize and wrestle with what this is because there was solid purity. There was solid purity. There was clear understanding of the purity of the church when we look at it. Jesus says to them, for those who, who haven't stained their clothes, they will wear white and they will walk with me. What is he saying to the people of Sibylle? You will wear a white robe that can't be blemished and you don't have to do debasing actions to get my affections. Actually, what he's saying is Jesus is telling them, you will put on my righteousness. Jesus offers them his righteousness. They would be included in real purity, in real love. They'd be given solid security. Not some facade built on a human structure, but security that is found by being victorious and your name being written in the book of life and declared before God the Father. They would get something that would actually hold them fast for eternity. When we look at this and understand what Jesus is saying, what he's juxtaposing, your purity is filthy. Your security is rotten. Your inclusion is a lie, but I'm none of those things. Let all come to me. Jesus brings them to him. He invites everyone to him. He washes every sinner white in the righteousness of his life, death, and resurrection. And he makes secure those of us who live a life in this world where maybe we feel like, oh, God, what's gonna happen? Here's what we know. Our circumstances will be trying at times. We will have difficult things. But our victory is not in our circumstances. It's in our Savior. And we hold on to Jesus Christ and know that one day he will dress us in white, the white of his righteousness. He will parade us before his Father and we will stand as the saints before the throne of God. When we look at that and understand that our security in Jesus Christ is found not in the security of this life, but in our hope being only in Jesus, we realize that our money, our fame, our talents, our status, our company, our job, our appearance, our influence, all these things we make idols of, those things are as useful to your security eternally as the walls of Sardis were during the reign of King Cyrus. Those things we take as security Literally, you and I are going at the end of this life alone in a box. There's nothing we take with us except for the assurance of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Your money, fame, talent, influence, culture, whatever you have, appearance is not of any use just as the walls of Sardis were of of no use to the people there. We have to look at it and understand that we as the church are called to rest our security, our identity, and our hope in one place. And it's found in the great old hymn of the church. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When we recognize that our purity, our inclusion, our security, and our hope is is wrought in Jesus Christ. It is found in Jesus Christ. He is the rock on which our salvation holds for eternity, our hope holds presently, we look and we understand here and now that on Christ the solid rock we find ourselves and in him we're fully alive and apart from him there is no life. Church, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit's saying. Your life is a living witness to the gospel. Your life is called to preach it. You are called to be secure and held in one truth. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground, it just wastes away. It's sinking sand. May that hope push you forward in the calling you are given, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your name. Thank you for the hope and the power of who you are. 
And we ask, God, even as we turn our hearts back in worship towards you, that you would give us a sense of clarity and understanding, that we would not find ourselves wanting for the securities, the inclusions, and the fames of this life, the purities that feel so good because we did something right. May we hold fast to you and you alone. May we experience the, pu- the purity, the security, and the inclusion of the gospel that calls us as we are to Jesus and then transforms us in his righteousness. Thank you, God, that there is no act we can do that will save our souls. There is only the act of submitting and admitting we are sinful, confessing, repenting, and turning towards the one who has made us righteous by his blood. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, please stand. Sing with me. Thanks for tuning in to watch this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare for next week, click the link below in the description box. There's where you'll find devotions. Now devotions are a crucial part of the Foundry's weekly rhythm. I hope this message has been encouraging, but also challenging for you. And we'd love to see you again next week.